At the end of the First World War, the victorious allies had severely punished Germany. The Treaty of Versailles had forced the Germans to give up huge areas of national land and all overseas colonies, reduce armed forces to practically nothing, and pay a vast sum of money called reparations to France, Britain, and Belgium. Harsh terms of peace fueled the smoldering embers of the First World War and burst into the flames that became the Second World War. The year is 1932. It's an election year. The Nazi party, led by Adolf Hitler, promises to tear up the Treaty of Versailles, build up the armed forces, provide jobs for everybody, and reunite the fatherland. Hitler's simplest but most sinister idea involves convincing the Germans that the Jews are to blame for all of Germany's problems. Brown-shirted Nazi thugs, called stormtroopers, beat up Jews in the streets and destroy their property. As Hitler tightens his grip on Germany, other European nations are also moving towards totalitarian or fascist states. Fascism is a system of government that glorifies the state and a single all-powerful ruler. Any opposing views are outlawed. You had a leader who was above reproach whom you didn't vote in and out of office, who took office and stayed there forever. So individual rights, individual liberties are suppressed under fascist rule. And the idea is that the most important thing for an individual is to give his life for the state. Fascism became popular in European nations that were suffering economic depression after World War I. In Italy, fascist Benito Mussolini wanted to build a new Roman Empire. In the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin is creating a military superpower and forcing the nation to obey his commands. In the 1930s, the fascists and communists swarmed across Europe. General Francisco Franco, with Hitler's and Mussolini's help, took over Spain by way of a bloody civil war. Hitler's armies marched into Austria and Czechoslovakia. Hitler and Stalin signed a treaty of friendship, then carved up Poland. German dive bombers, sirens screaming, swept over Poland in advance of fast-moving panzer tanks in a blitzkrieg or lightning war. Next, the Germans invaded Denmark and Norway. A month later, panzers rolled through Holland and Belgium in an end run around the French fortifications. After France surrendered in June 1940, almost all of Western Europe was under Axis control. To pound the British into submission, Hitler launched an all-out air war. The Nazis had begun their shattering blitz on Britain. Hello, America. This is Edward Murrow speaking from London. There were more German planes over the coast of Britain today than at any time since the war began. As the Battle of Britain raged overhead, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill rallied the British people on the radio, just as Roosevelt had done for Americans during the Great Depression with his fireside chats. The British people, Churchill said, faced a time of blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Meanwhile, in the North Atlantic, German submarines in wolf packs threatened to strangle Great Britain by cutting it off from the rest of the world. With France defeated and British forces tied up in North Africa, Hitler stunned the world once again. On June 22, 1941, 120 German divisions poured into the Soviet Union and quickly penetrated all the way to Stalingrad. The Soviet Union turned to the United States for help. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was quick to recognize the implications of dictators seizing power in Europe and Asia. 
He believed that if Britain fell and the Axis powers were victorious, freedom and democracy would be in danger everywhere. But many Americans didn't want anything to do with another war in Europe. In the 1930s, a majority of Americans believed that U.S. participation in World War I had been a mistake. Many believed that the country's involvement had been manipulated by big business. This popular belief gave rise to Senate hearings led by Senator Nye to investigate the role that businesses had played in the United States' decision to enter World War I. The hearings found that U.S. businesses had not conspired to trick the country into entering the war in order to make more money. But the hearings did expose that more than one quarter of the top 100 corporations were doing business with Nazi Germany. We do not inquire into the use of the products, one chemical industry official stated. We are interested in selling them. To prevent the United States from being drawn into another war in Europe, Congress passed a series of neutrality acts. Roosevelt thought this ostrich-like legislation was wrong. He wanted the United States to help Britain defeat the Nazis without being drawn into the war. After Italy invaded Ethiopia and Japan invaded China in 1937, he made a stirring call to embargo or quarantine such aggressors. But those who wanted to stay neutral, called isolationists, continued to fight to keep the United States out of the conflict. After Hitler's conquest of France in June of 1940, FDR had to figure out how to help Great Britain without breaking the neutrality laws. In September 1940, during his campaign for an unprecedented third term as president, Roosevelt authorized the transfer of 50 old American destroyers to the British in exchange for a few Atlantic naval bases in the so-called Destroyers for Bases deal. Re-elected in 1940, FDR got around the law against aiding the Allies by lending rather than selling arms to Great Britain and convinced Congress to lay out $7 billion to cover the cost of his Lend-Lease program. I've asked this Congress for authority and for funds sufficient to manufacture additional munitions and war supplies of many kinds to be turned over to those nations which are now in actual war with aggressor nations. Not surprisingly, the German Führer was less than pleased. Shipping arms to the Allies on whatever terms put the United States in the same position that the country had been in 25 years earlier, as a neutral supplier on the eve of World War I. In a sense, history was repeating itself. German U-boats once again went on the attack, and the United States vessels once again became the targets. When a U-boat sunk the U.S. destroyer Reuben James off Iceland, the United States neutrality went to the bottom with its crew. Two weeks later, Congress voted to arm merchantmen, and the American people began to prepare themselves for another war. Sunday, December 7, 1941. Frederick Mm. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor stunned the nation. On December 8, 1941, President Roosevelt asked Congress for a declaration of war. I ask the Congress to declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. 
A half hour later, Congress obliged. Three days later, Germany and Italy honored their pledge to Tokyo and declared war on the United States. The United States, in turn, joined Britain and the Free French under Charles de Gaulle against the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo axis. But why, when the United States was focusing on events in Europe, did it get attacked by Japan? The United States and Japan had been squaring off for a long time. Japan's desire to create what it called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere collided with America's insistence on equal access or the open door to China. When Japan invaded China in 1937, FDR condemned their aggression. Japan wanted to dominate all of East Asia and the Pacific. In 1940, Japan had signed the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy, providing added strength for future aggressions. By the spring of 1941, Japanese troops controlled French Indochina. The Roosevelt administration attempted to force Japan to cease its operations in Indochina and also to force the Japanese out of China by slapping a very strict embargo on oil and raw materials uh, to Japan. Since the United States was the world's greatest oil exporting nation at the time, and also was exporting steel and iron and so forth to Japan, this had a critical impact on Japan's economy. At some point, the Japanese think we, our economy will be brought to its knees if we don't get these, these things from the United States. So what we have to do is to carve out our own sphere of influence, not only in China, but in all of Southeast Asia. And in order to do that, we've got to hit the United States hard so the United States can't continue to hurt us. Attacking Pearl Harbor was the means by which they hoped to ensure their success. In the days after Pearl Harbor, Japanese troops invaded the British colonies of Hong Kong and Malaya, swept across the American-controlled Philippine Islands, and took the American-owned islands of Guam and Wake Island. In early 1942, the United States faced an incredible challenge. As the arsenal of democracy, it would have to supply war materials to its allies in Europe, rebuild its Pacific fleet, and wage its own war against Germany, Italy, and Japan, all at the same time. Realizing that an army marches on its stomach, American farmers rolled up their sleeves and during World War II reaped record-breaking billion bushel wheat harvests. By the end of the war, U.S. industries had manufactured 40 billion bullets, 300,000 aircraft, 86,000 tanks, two and a quarter million machine guns, and 76,000 ships. To accomplish these unprecedented feats of industrial production, Factories in the United States employed millions of workers who worked long hours for large paychecks. Americans on the home front were financially better off than they had been since the 1920s. The Second World War not only changed how people lived, but where they lived. 16 million Americans put on uniforms during the war and headed for training camps and their assignments at home and abroad. Women also joined the armed forces. They joined the WACs, the Women's Army Corps. They joined the WAVES, which was the women's branch of the Navy. Uh, and they also joined the Women's Army Air Corps. Now, most of these women did not serve overseas. The idea behind putting women into the military was that they would do the support jobs so that the men could be freed up to go into combat. So most of the women who were in the WACs or in the WAVES actually served at home in clerical and administrative functions. There was, however, a group of women pilots who trained Army pilots to go into combat. They trained them, but they were not members of the military, and they were not allowed to join the military. So they were never eligible for GI Bill benefits after the war. 
millions of job seekers headed for the centers of transportation and industry. California alone saw its population grow by nearly two million. Boom towns like Los Angeles, Seattle, Baton Rouge, and Detroit attracted hundreds of thousands of would-be workers. 70,000 people poured into Washington, D.C. in the first year after Pearl Harbor to administer new agencies created. During World War II, big government became a permanent fixture of American life. Back in 1938, Roosevelt had called the South the nation's number one economic problem. FDR used the war to accelerate the region's economic development. The states of the old Confederacy received a disproportionate share of defense contracts, including nearly $6 billion of federally financed industrial facilities. No group was more affected by the war than Southern blacks. Three quarters of a million left their farms for jobs in southern cities. Renewing the great outward migration of World War I, a million and a half left their homes to seek employment in the war plants of the West and North. The war also revitalized African Americans' struggle for racial equality. How, they asked, could America fight a war in the name of freedom and democracy, while at home it still discriminated against African Americans and other minorities. One of the real problems that Americans had uh, in fighting the war was that they were fighting the Nazis, a racist government which was well known for its horrendous racial policies. The American racial policies are not all that good either because Americans have a racially segregated society and it's very, very hard to maintain the racial segregation in the United States when you're being pressed uh, to fight an enemy who, who is known for his racism. So what the war does is put pressure on the, the ancient uh, bad racial attitudes of white America and it ultimately leads to de the desegregation of the armed forces uh, and I think ultimately to the civil rights movement. In 1941, to protest discrimination in the nation's war industries, labor leader A. Philip Randolph threatened to march 100,000 blacks on Washington, D.C. To prevent this, FDR issued an executive